Testing, 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 testing. Testing, 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 testing. All right, for some reason that wasn't working well, but I'm back to the Yeti. Okay. Welcome everybody, Can Hammer TV. I'm listening to myself. So thank you, welcome everybody to Can Hammer TV. Your source for 40k from the Great White North. It is uh, Custodes Tactica Part 8 episode, and we will get to that shortly. Tonight we'll be talking about uh, all the other stuff. So last week we talked about list building. This week, as a kind of adjunct to list building, we're going to be talking about warlord traits, uh, rules, and stratagems. And then uh, the stratagems part then leads us into the next episode, which will be on deployment, which possibly is one of the most important episodes and then after deployment we have some other topics that people have asked about that we'll be covering if you have a topic you'd like me to cover then let me know somehow in chat facebook whatever on here uh let me know and we can make sure we cover that in the tactica series so before we do that we're going to talk news so in the news blood angels are good blood angels are probably going to be extremely good because it looks like they're getting massive point decreases and then getting a massive amount of rules. Most of the rules that Space Marines have and then all their extra shot. So Blood Angels are probably going to be a thing. Um, there have been some um, chapter approved leaks all today. Some pages are easier to read than others. Dark Angels look like they're getting some nice decreases. Um, Space Wolves across the board have been decreased. A lot of chaos stuff. Anyway, it seems like a lot of people getting point decreases. In other news, Tyranid players are pretty salty right now for whatever reason. Um, and in other news, Custodes leaks. So unfortunately, since nobody really cares about Custodes, um, our leaks are in the bottom right corner of a folded like page. And so it's very hard to read. Um it looks like Agamatis Custodians going to either 80 or 90. Uh, Aquilon is either 80 or 90. It looks like 90, but it's hard to read. Ares Gunship, I think, says 315. Caladius, <sighs> impossible to read. Contemptor, 130, looks like. Galatis, maybe 130 as well. Cronus, 2 something. Uh, Custodian with Adrocyte, it's like looks like a four or something but uh, i can't guarantee o orion looks like it starts with a three uh palace is just two digits oh palace grabbed attack is just two digits now um, i'll come back to that in a second sagittarium looks like it starts with a four the telemon starts with a two for sure and venetari looks like it starts with a four now there is some talk right now on the custodies chat that this is just the pre this is like the beta points pre-finalizing because of course the final um forge world points and rules came out after chapter proof was probably written and so some people think that this is just old points and that is going to be errata or FAQ'd in a week or a couple weeks after chapter approved that here's the actual points. Now, there's one argument against that. The original points for the grav attack and always has been 100 points. And in this list, it says grav attack, it looks like 75 or maybe it's 85 or 95. Whatever it is, it's only two digits. Okay, it's definitely not three digits. It's not as wide as the three digit numbers. It's definitely only two digits. So, this might be true. 
Now, it'd be nice if we could get a clearer picture. And I've asked some people I know who probably have advanced copies and have yet to receive any clearer pictures. So we shall see. But I think this might be real. Um, yeah. And that's the biggest clue that I have is because the grav attack has dropped from three digits to two digits. Of course, it was only one point away from dropping to two digits. So uh, there you go. So that's very interesting. Now, we can conjecture a little bit, you know. So if Agamatis goes down to 90, that's a drop from 120. Um, it's un... Uh, well, it was 120 with the... I can't remember what it was now. I'd have to... Get the rules. Uh, hang on a second. Let me get it. Snoop Deville three, by the way. Welcome. Uh, okay, so um, these are the old points values oh no okay nope i was wrong actually the palace is 75 um yeah because that's without weapons okay so actually this might very well just be um the uh, old points aquilon 65 I gotta tell you what though, so Agamatis looks like 80, but the Aquilon does not look like 65 in this picture, although God knows. Um, yeah, who knows? We're just gonna have to wait. We're just gonna have to wait. No big deal. Um, I'll keep pestering people I know. Uh, and uh, hey Snoop DeVille, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'll just keep pestering I know who have leaks and we'll see if we can get a, cl a clearer picture. So no point talking much about it until we have a picture. I'd be very disappointed if we had no um, points decreases on some of our non forgeable stuff, so the Codex stuff. As I've said many times, I don't think they're going to change any of the forgeable stuff because um, they would have known that those rules were coming out. So there's no reason to change those. But they're listing all the points, so um, therefore they would just relist them, hopefully the same as the finalized rules. Uh, yes, and happy Thanksgiving to our U.S. watchers. We had quite a number of people watching today's uh, Day Hammer because everybody didn't have to work. So that's cool. I very appreciate that. Um, had a great game against Nick, Nick Blackburn, playing his Chaos as requested by the Custodes group. And it was a, a small victory to Custodes. Uh, scrappy game. Um, pretty tight up until kind of end of five, top of six. And uh, so it's a good game. Uh, it's always fun playing Nick, and I appreciate the effort it takes him to come all the way down here to play. And um, so it's always good fun. So uh, you can catch that on Twitch and on YouTube. Um, it's a great game, so uh, do check it out. It's a way of, you know, smite spam, one of those kind of things. It's not as hardcore anymore, but it's still pretty hardcore, especially when you keep rolling three damage on your smites. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So we'll see. There's a lot of um, leaks and stuff flying around right now for chapter proof. So we shall see what that brings us. So Snoop DeVille, we were just talking. Um, we don't know. We have the, there's a page right here of uh, Custodes point changes, but it is too blurry to make out. And it looks like it's basically just the same points. Um, and these are, of course, the four drilled units. So these are unlikely to change, but I would really want to know what's happening with our codex units. Um, so we don't know that yet. We'll just have to wait. Nobody's taking pictures of custodies points for us. Okay. Um, so, uh, in other news, Can Hammer Team Tournament 2020, February 8th and 9th in Ottawa is now up to 26 teams. And why that is important is because basically for a team tournament, how ITC points work is, uh, it counts as, in terms of number of people or size of tournament, each team counts as one person. So it's really, before this, is only a 24-man tournament, which not even getting you GT, GT number of points. So we needed to get to 26 to get people at least a GT number of points. And so there it is. So we're up to 26 teams. Um, terrain's getting tight, uh, but we could probably expand more. We have 26 teams and one team on the wait list. So we need two more teams to expand by two more teams. So if you still want to bring a team, there's still plenty of time. Do get on it soon. 
and um, uh, we will uh, take it on. We have uh, probably a registration deadline of the um, same as the list submission probably, which is January 12th. January 12th, midnight is the list submission. The captains must submit all the team members' lists in one document to us by email. That document ideally is something that we can edit and put together with other team lists easily. Um, and it must be in ETC format. The format is right in the player's pack. It's been the same format for many years, so get it right. Um, and uh, the only difference this year is each player has to write the 18-card deck that they're also playing uh, below their army lists. That's the new thing with ETC this year. So uh, so please do that and um, get those lists in. Late lists will be penalized on the sports score, as it says in our sports rubric and as it has said for many years. So um, do get it in January 12th, midnight. And then what happens is we put all the lists together, take us a few days, and then we send the document out to all the team captains, and each team is assigned three other teams to list check and let us know errors, and then we check as many and find as many errors and correct as many errors as we can. Last year, actually, we had very few errors. Um, and then... Uh, and then once the error checking is done and the final lists are published, those lists are final. They are considered legal on the day, even if mistakes are seen later. People have their chance to find errors and let us know, and that's their chance. On the day, if it's passed, it's legal, even if it is technically illegal. So, and keep in mind that the list checking is for errors not for optimizing. So if you just forgot to put a weapon option on your warlord on your list, you can't add that. That is not an error. That is just an omission. Uh, whereas if uh, something is listed as 30 points, but it's actually only 20 points, then you will get 20 points taken off your point total, but you can't then add something to make up that 10 points that you just gained. So um, this is just error checking, not omissions or optimizing. Okay, um, so that's Ken Hammer team update. Um, oh yeah, one other update to the captains out there. If you have a grudge, uh, there has been a number of grudges already. If you want to grudge somebody, let us know. We voted and everybody wants to do grudges. So we'll do first round grudges. Okay. Um, so uh, my hobby project right now is GSC. Gene Steeler Cult, I am putting a call out there to the listeners and viewers of Can Hammer. I need three Neophyte Webbers. Apparently these are really hard to find. The web guns, not the little web pistols, the web guns. I need three of them to complete my army. So if you have three Webbers or one Webber or a whole Neophyte model with the web gun, I'm good with any version of it. Uh, let me know and I will pay you nicely for it and uh, ship it out to me. So um, if anybody out there has Webbers, please let me know. Not Andrew Webbers, Webbers. Um, cool. Uh, so without further ado, we will go on. Um, Okay, so Tactica starts now. So uh, last time we talked about list building, uh, I had good feedback about last episode. People found it pretty useful. They also found the uh, battle scribe thing useful. I didn't find it that easy to use, but uh, if it was useful, that's great. We talked about the various list archetypes, uh, uh, sort of overall types of lists that custodians generally run, and we gave some examples and built some lists. Um, there's, if you're interested in joining our Custodes Collective uh, chat group on Discord, on the Canhammer Discord, please let me know and uh, we will get you linked up. Uh, what I'll do is I'll post it right here. I'll post it in the chat right now. I just got to type it out, of course, because it's on my phone. Discord. Okay, HTTPS. Discord.gg H4VJNEP. All right, there's the Discord chat. Do feel free to join us and um, and uh, join in the chat. We go through lists all the time, pure lists, soup lists, all sorts of things. We discuss tactics. We go over the latest battle reports. People can post their games and with pictures and stuff, and we can comment and help people through. It's really quite a good chat. Uh, I'm really super proud of the guys for making such a constructive, 
chat um and um they're also telling me what games they want to see and so and what topics they want on the tactica so it's really good do consider joining if you're watching this you probably benefit from joining if you're not already a member um so um this today's episode will be on the other things that you need to build the list warlord traits um general rules and stratagems mostly stratagems and just to round out list building and start to head on towards to actually how to play and then we're going to hit things like deployment and stuff like that next time so first thing to talk about really is our special rules we don't have that many we're not marines um basically um Almost all custodies units have a five up invuln. I think basically all custodies units have a five up invuln, including our vehicles and our dreadnoughts, at least a five up. So the whole army has a five up. And then um, uh, we can uh, take a, uh, we have a six up funeral pain against mortal wounds in the psychic phase. I would love that to be a five up personally. Today I ate so much psychic mortals and rolled one six up out of all of those is really not great a uh, five up would be much better uh and or also give us just general mortal wound protection not just psychic phase but against all mortal wounds that would be nice every single wound hurts when you only have 15 models and um just taking random mortals here and there from stupid exploding abilities or uh, mortals on five ups or, it, it just hurts so much um so it would be really nice if we had some a little bit more resilience these days we're not asking for much but right now it's everything kills us so easily and you only have 15 models you're kind of screwed so a little bit of extra resilience would be nice and that would help a little bit making it a five up mortal save mortal save in general or at least a five up against the psychic mortals there's not a lot of spice spam out there right now so you know it's not even that useful rule right now so if you run a battleforged army that's all custodies which you should you should never run a mixed attachment with custodies because then those guys are just five up um then your invuln save goes to a four up so there is an almost army-wide four up the only thing that doesn't have four ups are your vehicles um which i think they should get four up too but anyway that's another topic um so basically your whole army has a four up invuln which is great however these days you're basically just taking four ups all the time um, which is not great. 50% of the time you're going to fail and four ups are, are that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, I don't know how to make that a little bit better. Giving us all army wide three up would be too strong because three ups can be really strong. Um, and some people have suggested that maybe something like transhuman, so we could only be wounded on fours, which is great against all the large stuff, but against the smaller stuff that's killing us, um, doesn't help us that much because they're already winning us on five so i'm not sure how useful that would be but you know it'd be something but anyway so the whole army is four up involved so you only run them um you, you can soup them but in the detachment itself needs to be but needs to be just custodies There's, uh, you would not run them as a mixed detachment there'd be almost no reason to do that um and then if you're in such a detachment everything is obsec so basically everything with sworn guardians is obsec which is basically everything except for the vehicles uh and i think the dreadnoughts don't have it either just have to check i think the dreadnoughts don't get uh sworn guardians yeah no they don't have it Yeah, just infantry and bikers. So so um, the Dreadnoughts don't get it and the vehicles don't get it. Which is a shame. Like, it'd be nice if everything got it. It'd be really nice if our tanks were obsec. Really nice. Um, as we showed today on the uh, on the stream against Nick. Like, a obsec tank flying in there and just charging a little character and just stealing that objective late game. That would be pretty sweet. So, as it is, though, uh, it is what it is right now. So, that's it. We have no other rules. Uh, no natural rerolls or this or that or fall back and charge or nope we got none um, so the fairly um, uh, rules focused around resilience and uh, playing with a smaller number of models so everything kind of gets obsec um, now the obsec rule 
on everything really comes into play more often than you'd think, especially on things like bikers. A lot of people still don't realize that our bikers are obsec. A biker captain is obsec. Um, you know, the vexilla is obsec. You know, um, people sometimes don't realize or forget it or didn't know. And so uh, a unit of one or two bikers left flying around grabbing objectives with obsec is super good. So um, never give up on those small units. They can still do a lot of work. Don't throw them away like I did today um, because the obsec rule on them is really quite useful, especially near the end of the game when you hopefully have killed all your opponent's troops already. So uh, so super good. Uh, keep that in mind that everything is obsec. Okay, so we have no other rules to talk about. It's fairly straightforward. We're going to go over some warlord traits and then we're going to talk about stratagems at the end. Okay, warlord traits. So um, in my mind, all our warlord traits are actually pretty good. And it's really kind of a meta decision. And who you make your warlord depends on what warlord trait you take. I think, you know, f at least four, three or four out of the six are good warlord traits. They're nice abilities. Um, some of them are less useful. Um, I generally make my Vexilla the warlord for a number of reasons. First of all, him as the warlord does not give up four Kingslayer points. Uh, Valoris gives up four Kingslayer. Uh, Alaris Captain gives up four Kingslayer. Shield Captain gives up four Kingslayer. So uh, Vexilla, uh, Shield Captain on bike. So Vexilla as your warlord does not give up full Kingslayer. Um, he, the Vexilla is minus one to hit natively because he has the banner, which may or may not be helpful. Uh, the way I run him with the Storm Shield makes him really hard to kill. Um, and so, and he's got five wounds and so he's fairly tough. Um, number two, um, he is the least, the character least likely to get in his hands dirty. Um, so therefore, um, you know, he's less, least likely to die. Um, of course, if you have a shield captain, you go always save a CP for shoulder to mantle, but you know, generally, um, the fact that he's a warlord killing the warlord generally doesn't really help in itc as much but obviously it gives away points in etc so just for lots of reasons why i make the vexilla the warlord um so with that in mind uh, my favorite warlord trait right now champion of the, of the imperium so this allows um biker uh biker and infantry and dreadnought units within 12 inches of the warlord within 12 inches not wholly within to heroically intervene and what this means is at the end of your opponent's charge phase even if they didn't charge anything you these any of the units that are within 12 inches of the vexilla of the warlord can now perform a heroic intervention a heroic intervention lets you move three inches towards uh, uh, towards the closest model, as long as you end up within an inch of it. Okay, so you can't, you don't just get a random three-inch movement. You have to actually get into combat, basically. Now, you can still heroically intervene if you are already within an inch of an enemy model, as long as you're not based. Okay, a lot of people don't know this. So, as long as you are not based. Okay, you can still move closer to that model. Therefore, you can perform a heroic intervention in at in the end of your opponent's charge phase. This can get you three inches of extra movement. And then if you do a pile in and a consolidate, you could get nine inches of extra movement on your opponent's turn. That's a lot. That is farther than you move in your own phase, all in your opponent's turn. Okay, so this is super key just for the movement alone to be able to do that. Also, by using your heroics uh, uh, cleverly, you can use that to tag tanks. You can use that to get into combat with characters that weren't expecting it. You can use that um, to block off your opponents because uh, it's before they can pile in. You can block their pile-ins. Um, you can do all sorts of things. So today, by using the heroic intervention on the demon prince, I stopped the demon prince from getting recon by piling in around me because then I used my movement to block the demon prince. So, so it's totally that three inches of movement is, is so good. That's why this, I think, is the best warlord trait because your vexilla is well, another reason to make your vexilla he's going to be the guy at the front who just dropped the terminators in he's going to be the guy at the front behind the bikes giving minus one to hit at everything so so and a 12 inch aura is 
big. I thought it was only six inches till last week. Somebody reminded me it's 12 and I actually read it. So huge, huge, huge. Um, today it just saved me and we're going to demonstrate. Okay. We're going to demonstrate right now. Okay. Let's go to the overhead. All right. I just had to remember that you have it and keep it in mind. So many uses for this Warlord trait is just so good. Um, so yeah, definitely. So Champion Imperium, probably our best Warlord trait. Um, Peerless Warrior. Each time you make a hit roll of six for your Warlord in the fight phase, they can immediately make an extra attack using the same weapon. So exploding sixes basically, but not generating hits, just generating attacks. That's not great when your characters only have five attacks to start with. That's not good if you're lucky, like one or two attacks. So not good, not good. One of the worst ones. Superior Creation is a five up Femal Pain. So that's pretty nice. Uh, five up Femal Pain is strong. And uh, the only reason maybe it's slightly lackluster is your Warlord probably not taking a lot of damage. Um, although that may be slightly worse today in all the snipers and eliminators around, but still our characters are fairly hard to kill. So we probably don't need a five up feel no pain. Um, obviously if you're going into a game against like 40 sniper scouts or something, maybe you will take the five up feel no pain, but so you can decide that on a game by game basis, but generally you don't need the five up feel no pain. Impregnable mind is a good one. Warlord can attempt to deny and gets plus one as if they were a psyker. So that's pretty good good except it's just one deny and so the chances of that being super useful against an army that is strong on the psychics uh is probably low and those people usually have pluses to cast or extra distance or things like that in which case they'll just play around your deny so it's not that good even though it looks good on paper um it's like a librarian with a psychic hood and how many times have you actually denied anything with a librarian <laughs> so yeah not that useful we do have the stratagem which we'll talk about later for denying which can be useful i think that's probably a better way of denying um than a warlord trait um so i would give that a pass but it obviously can be useful in certain matchups radiant mantles minus one to hit for your warlord it's actually an interesting one to take on the vexilla now the vexilla is minus two to hit and actually minus one also in combat because the vexilla doesn't work in combat so that's pretty interesting that's probably pretty hard to kill your um to kill your vexilla keep in mind that um um again not a lot of things going to be shooting your vexilla so maybe not that great it'd be interesting to try that on a shield captain uh warlord actually one day just to see how that works running around being minus one to hit all the time might be pretty good make them even more annoying to kill and then empress companion reroll the dice for the damage so one of my bugbears is that everything is freaking D3 and everything should be straight 2. Valor should be straight 3, not D3. So I don't want to take this Warlord trait just to help GW write better rules. 
So uh, out of principle, I'm not taking this warlord trait because I shouldn't have to roll d3s all the time. Call me silly, but yeah, I don't think that's very good. So anyway, so those are the warlord traits. Obviously, if you do run Valoris as your uh, uh, warlord, he has to have the champion of the Imperium warlord trait. So there you go. Okay, relics, and then we're going to talk stratagems. Okay, there's really only a couple of relics that are worth taking. Um, obviously, if you're running a shield captain and he's going to be getting aggressive, the Orc Aquilus is one of the best relics. It makes him three up, which is almost a must-have. Otherwise, that captain is that much easier to kill. The difference between a four up and a three up invuln is huge. Um, and then it also gives him reroll charges, which is kind of nice if you remember it. So Orc Aquilus, one of the best ones. Similar to that is the Eagle's Eye, which gives any character uh, plus one invuln. So obviously a three up invuln. So that's great. Um, I used to, um, you could run that on the uh, Vexilla, for example, if he doesn't have a Storm Shield, or you could just get the Storm Shield. So you can make two or three characters with three up invuln. So so uh, that's actually a, a decent one to throw around. Or if you're running two bike captains and you have an extra relic, then you know you can put one on both on three up invuln. So I think those two are the first two takes for sure. None of the weapon ones are worth it. The two banner ones, because you lose the minus one to hit banner, not worth it. None of those things are worth it. Uh, none of the shooting ones are worth it. Don't take any of those. Um, the uh, um, There's a couple of other ones that we'll talk about. One is the Praetorian Plate. So this is the one that I'm messing with right now in my list. I put it on my Captain and Alaris Terminator armor. And so it gives him a, a redeploy, basically, like a, a infinite range heroic intervention. So at the end of your opponent's uh, charge phase, if something you nominate an Imperium character, so Imperium character, not Custodes character, so you could do it on G-Man or Company Commander or Celestine or whoever you like, uh, you know, a Chapter Master or something. And then at the end of the charge phase, if somebody's in combat with that person, basically, your Praetorian plate dude just appears right next to them. And that's pretty cool. That even works if that uh, captain is not on the table. Uh, so you could go from deep strike straight into combat. And of course, your opponent did not declare that person as a target of their charge. And um, you don't get to, you didn't count as charging, so you had to wait your turn. But that can be pretty swingy. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, in my case, what I'm doing is in games where I have my captain at the back being my tank buffer, then uh, once the Vexilla gets into range or gets into combat or gets charged, now my captain can jump forward and get into the action. So that's a little relic I'm playing around. I didn't need the 3-up invuln relic because I have a storm shoot on my Vexilla um, and I don't have a shield captain uh, on bike. So... Um, so that's something I'm playing around with. Alternatively, I could just give the eagle eye to my captain and make him a three-up invuln shield cap, uh, shield cap, a large captain, which I might do. Uh, if I don't end up using the Praetorian plate in the next two or three games, I'm probably just going to replace it with a straight-up three-up invuln. Um, so that would be better. Um, but that's an interesting thing to play around with, uh, especially if you're a soup player. Uh, you should really keep in mind the Praetorian plate. Um, the other one is the Raiment of Sorrows, which is what Carlos was talking about on our interview a couple episodes back. So basically, um, this is a um, it on a uh, within six inches of the bearer, infantry and biker models on a four up can shoot one shooting weapon or make a single attack. Uh, kind of like the uh, Space Marine banners that uh, the, the used to the Chapter Ancients. He really liked it. I'm not a big fan. First of all, you have to be with die within six inches of the relic. You know, not too bad, I guess, if you put on the Vexilla. Um, then, but then you have to do roll a four up. And you're not going to spend a CP to reroll that four, especially if you only start with like three or four CP. So really, it's a 50% chance of doing something. If you're in combat, you're not going to be able to shoot anything. Um, and, you know, one person shooting not going to probably do a big deal. 
And if you're making one single attack, the most you can do is kill one model. So I just don't, I just don't see how it's that good. Maybe Carlos has uh, had more experience with it than I have. I haven't never tried it, so I just don't like those banners uh, unless they're at least like a three up or a two up that it happens. On a four up is not great. It's really not good. Um, so yeah, I would generally stay away from that. But if you want to quiz uh, Carlos about it, you definitely should. Um, Okay, one uh, honorable mention is this Auric Shackles. So opponent must subtract one from their attacks of enemy characters while they're within six of the bearer. And uh, if you slay the enemy warlord in the fight phase, you score additional D3 victory points. So um, so really, that final part where you get the extra victory points is really only for rulebook missions. It doesn't work that way in ETC or ITC formats, so that's kind of a waste of half the realm. And a minus one attack from something is not that big a deal, and it's only characters. If you could just minus one attack from all units within six inches, that would be sick. But just against characters, you know, not a big deal. Um, so, uh, yeah, especially now Marines getting like extra attack from this, extra attack from this. I think a, a Blood Angel Intercessor Death Company is going to have like eight attacks base or something stupid. So anyway, so those are the relics. Random Scrub, welcome. A uh, full Mithril Alchemist, cool name. Is the Custodian meta still bringing a dozen or so bikes and some shield captains? No, sir, it is definitely not. You sound like somebody who should join our... Uh, custodies discord and learn about the new way of playing custodies here you go here is the link um okay now we're gonna go on to the stratagems okay Bikes are still good, man, but I just think the day of spamming bikes is no longer with us right now. Um, okay, so uh, stratagems. We're just going to go through each stratagem, yay or nay, and talk about in-game uses to remember. And if we need to, we can demo stuff on the tabletop. Okay, from Golden Light they come. This is our deep strike stratagem. Basically, infantry, biker, dreadnought, we can deep strike. One for one CP, two for three CP. 3 CP to deep strike two things is expensive. Uh, in a CP limited army, um, you know, I haven't used this strategy in a long time. If you're playing a battalion and you have some CP to throw around, I think the obvious targets of this are uh, either an HQ like Valoris, if you want to get them further forward, or um, like a unit of wardens. Obviously, Aqualon, Alaris, they can all deep strike. Um, and a unit of bikes is a good target for this, like a decent sized unit, because it gets them forward. Not so much because they have a lot of mobility, but it stops them getting shot. So um, you can use this stratagem defensively as well. Um, I'll just keep in mind that uh, these days with infiltrators, you gotta uh, make sure you don't leave yourself no options of where to come in. Uh, when you deep strike these days so just keep that in mind or against you know 200 orcs or gene student cult like you may find yourself that that was not really worth spending the cp on if you just deep strike into your own zone again two turns later um and sometimes having your units on the table as deterrence uh can be very mentally useful so I think uh, you know obviously it's really nice to have this ability and you can use it on your dreadnoughts I know Tyler in the collective uh, chat with his triple Telemon is obviously spending this stratagem all the time, um, but um, it's always useful for, for a book to have this ability. Unflinching. So this is the five up Overwatch stratagem for one CP. Um, I like this. Uh, when I had played with more CP, I actually used this quite often. This is particularly good when uh, weak things are charging you and they're charging your bikes. Uh, so you need to do some quick mental math in your head when you're considering using this. How much better are you going to be overwatching on 5-up than on 6-up? I know overwatching on 5-up seems like it's really good, but in the age of 4-up Iron Hands, overwatch is really not good, that good, or Tau overwatch. But if you're shooting 60 bolter shots at you know 30 cultists charging you, 
and you reroll ones and hitting on fives, you kill a lot of those guys. Or orcs, a unit of 30 boys charging your five bikes, you're going to kill a bunch of orcs overwatching on five rerolling ones. So it's something really to consider. If you just have like three dudes with the normal bolt guns, like don't bother. Um, unless you're going to do significant damage, don't bother. Um, but if you have a unit, uh, this is where you're going to really use it, a unit of bikes. Um, in this day and age with uh, Caladius tanks, you might consider that. Uh, so a Caladius, a normal Caladius with the eight shots, uh, you know, if a character is charging you, um, you get overwatching on fives with a reroll one nearby, you would consider doing that because that's a lot of damage that guy's going to eat on the way in. And killing something in overwatch is a real morale uh, sucker for your opponent, uh, especially when they think that they were going to be getting in there. So, so that can be real swing. And of course, if you're going to be charged by multiple units and you manage to kill the first unit, you can then use this. You still overwatching. So it's the rest of the phase. So, so you should. Uh, it's a useful stratagem in the right circumstance. Unleashed Alliance. Okay, Unleashed Alliance for two CP lets you split your Alaris Terminators into individual units. I wish that this made them characters. That would be fluffy, and it would make it much better. As it is, what you're doing really is spending 2 CP to make your unit easier to kill, because now they can just shoot, and it's easy to kill one dude. The flip side of that is now they have to target priority and split their fire. Generally, these days, it's not hard to kill one Terminator. Um... So I don't think that that's a huge deal, um, but it may be. In ITC, I would really, I've already said this many times, highly, highly advise you against splitting your unit because now you've made a denial list, which is very hard to get kills against. You've given them four or five individual dudes to just kill. A uh, unit of eliminators will probably kill an Alaris Terminator. So now you've given up kill and kill more where normally you would be getting kill and not giving up kills and getting kill more. So in ITC, I don't think you should ever use this stratagem, except maybe if it's bottom of six and you need to get guys, you still have two CP for some reason, you still have lots of Alaris Terminators for some reason, and you need to get onto two close by objectives by splitting them, then sure, because you know nothing's going to happen to them if it's bottom of six. Um, so that's the only other time I would think either in ETC or in a situation where splitting them would get you more points uh, without giving up more points. So that's an option there. 2 CP at the end of the game is kind of hard for us to have. Or a full unit of Alaris Terminator. So, you know, you got to think about that. I personally don't think it's a great stratagem. I think it's very fluffy. It would have been even better if they were made characters. Because then that would be really cool. And of course, it's Alaris only be cool if you could just split any unit that would be cool you know in the fluff custodians don't work in units they just work as individual mod uh, individual dudes so this is kind of fluffy in that way um okay one of the best stratagems in the game coming up tangle foot grenades oh tangle foot so good again great today stop the plague marine unit from charging my one of my two remaining aqualon terminators uh, it, it's so good. So what this strategy is for one CP within 12 inches of an en of a custodies infantry uh, unit. So infantry uh, within 12 inches does not need line of sight. You can uh, at the beginning of their movement or uh, charge phase. So remember to do it at the beginning of movement and charge phase. They are move D6 less either moving or on the charge. So. That is amazing. Anything, movement is the most powerful thing. Things that move fast generally are good. Things that move slow often just get ignored because they move slow. Centurions were never even looked at. The only reason they're being used so much right now is because there's so many ways to get them forward. Okay, White Scars, Raven Guard, all that sort of stuff. If you have to walk four inch moving dudes from the back line up, they're not doing shit. Okay, so, so, uh, and, and as Nick noticed today, you know, those guys are only moving five, like it's, it's an impediment. So anything that makes people move less, Thunderfire Cannons, having people's movement, so powerful. Um, so a Tangle Foot can be so clutch. One CP Tangle Foot, so clutch, can be game changing. Um, it's so good. So 
in the movement phase, if you want to stop someone moving, tangle foot them. Keep in mind, you have to do it at the beginning of their phase, okay? Uh, so they know that you've done it. Now, obviously, you could also just roll a one, but you might not. You might roll a six. Um, so very important. If somebody needs to get on an objective in order to cap, cap it to win the game or something or to swing the game, tangle foot them. Um, using it to prevent fallback. So obviously, this depends on how far the uh, person moves obviously if somebody moves 12 and um and this doesn't work against fly obviously but if something moves 12 and you tangle foot the most you can move is six and they can still move six that doesn't stop them falling back but if a uh a, a centurion is only moves four and they need to fall back to greater than an inch away from you that means if you roll a three or a four they can't fall back so that's actually if, um that's actually a 66% chance that they won't be able to fall back. Things moving five, you need a four, five, six, so a 50% chance they can't fall back. And things ne moving six need a 30% chance you need a five or a six. So actually, it's decent odds. And if you really want to spend another CP to reroll that, so it's decent odds of stopping your opponent from falling back. So, um,. Now, keep in mind, you have to do it at the beginning of the turn of the movement phase. So then they might just decide, OK, fuck it. Obviously, they're not, they're, they're, they'll know if they can fall back or not. But still, that's really good. Uh, the thing that most people use it for, of course, is on the charge, tangle foot them so they fail to charge. Uh, and especially if you got your tanks and they're minus two to charge and then you throw a tangle foot in, it can really fuck up things like gene stealers and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so and by that time, the pe people have already committed to go forward and try and make the charge, right? And it's never too close because it's a 12 is just a, a charge is always two dice, right? So, you know, a good tangle foot can really fuck up someone's charge. Even if they're only like four inches away, if they roll a two inch, three inch charge and then you tangle foot them for six, now they're going backwards. Uh, so today I tangle footed uh, Nick's guys. He rolled a double one as it was and I rolled a four. So that's actually going backwards two inches. <laughs> so tangle foot, so key. So key, so key. So Tanglefoot, probably one of our best stratagems uh, and uh, uh, very good. Just don't forget it. It also works in the movement phase. <coughs> okay. Enough about Tanglefoot. I could talk about Tanglefoot uses for a long time. Okay, the next stratagem is Ever Vigilant. This is our interceptor, basically. So they drop within 12 inches. Of an infantry unit, that infantry unit can intercept for two CP with a minus one to hit. It's not that good. Um, I think obviously if you have a big unit of Alaris Turners with flamers, and then you can flame some people when they come down. That's pretty good. Obviously, it depends on what's coming down, how much damage you're gonna do. It doesn't work on bikers, so usually it's just like Lastrum bolters or like the Custodes bolters. So generally not useful for two CP and a minus one to hit. So not a great stratagem with what we have to shoot with right now um, in the infantry slot. Um, Okay, teleport Homer. Okay, so um, this is something that got everybody worked up when Goonhammer put out their review and said teleport Homer was a B, B minus at best. And everybody was like, ah, well, you know, clearly these people don't have play experience. I gotta say, the only reason, one of the main reasons I actually have any CP at all is to Homer. Um, now, these days with infiltrators, uh, blocking out deep strike, which negates your homer, by the way, okay? Um, sometimes I have started my uh, terminators on the table and not used a homer, in which case I have four CP to use for something else. But almost always against other armies, terminators in space with the plan to homer them in. It just, it, it, with if your army is relying on a nine inch charge, you're gonna be just so disappointed half the time. I think the chances of making a nine inch charge is like 46% or something like that without a reroll. So it's just, it's, it's, it, it just, and then those guys are dead. So you really, really have to use the homer. Uh, if you have at least three CP, if you're running a battalion, you need to just take away three CP from your pool and leave it on the side for teleport homer. So teleport homer is just so good. And then that makes your charge a three inch charge as well. Um, so, 
Um, so, and which obviously you can still fail, but hopefully you won't. <laughs> Not like me, roll a double one into a one. Um, so otherwise, teleport Homer, so good. Three CP, and then you use the moment shackle and get your three CP back, like I did today. And that feels so good when you spend three CP and you get three back. And then now you have full CP to do other stuff. But um, the average is getting two back, so that's pretty good. Uh, so a one CP ability to drop within three inches of somebody, so good. Now. The other argument was, oh, everybody knows about it. They don't. They don't allow it. Um, even when people know about it, they either can't plan against it or they forget about it. Okay, I have not faced one opponent who really teched well against the teleport homer. Um, something is gonna get hit within three inches, so it's fine. It's either something important or an easy rap target. So. It's not really something you can easily um, prevent, except with infiltrators, so, and uh, so and you and you already know they have those. So so keep that in mind. Um, even if people know about it, and if they don't know about it, it for sure fucks them up. So so it's it's just so good. It's one of our must use stratagems. Now the other concern, the final concern that people have with teleport homer is how do you get your vexilla where it needs to go? Well, it's not that hard. Let me show you. Okay. So, let's use today, for example. So, here's a deployment. Okay, so we're deploying here. And we're in uh, pointy hammer and anvil. So, really, you can deploy all the way up to like 9 inches from the middle. Okay, but let's say you deploy a little bit further back. Okay, but generally, you want to keep your vexilla up near the front okay because that's its role to go forward teleport home or something in and give heroic intervention those are the three roles of the vexilla and minus one to hit so now if you're rolling average dice of a three or a four advance okay here's first move okay turn one turn two of course i can walk through all these runes turn three okay six inch radius Gets me all the way over there. That's plenty of space. And this is in the longest deployment type. In all the other deployments type, it's even greater. Table quarters is right there. Turn two, you're right in the opponent's zone. Vanguard strike, Dawn of War, even closer. So, uh, and that's assuming that you're trying to drop in your opponent's zone. If you're just trying to drop in the middle, one turn and you get there. So you actually don't even have to move for a turn or two. So that is completely not right. You can always get the Vexilla where you need to get it. And don't be afraid. Um, so that's if you just think about it with the advance, it's really easy to get your Vexilla up where you need it to go. Um, so, so yeah, don't be afraid. Embrace the chaos. Use that one. Okay. Open the vault. So this is our uh, relic stratagem. Obviously, if you need to do relics, I won't talk too long about that. Then do it. You should probably never be using 3CP for this because you really only want one extra relic. Okay, I kind of like switching over to the uh, overhead when we need to demonstrate things. Okay, Avatars of the Emperor. At the beginning of morale phase, choose an Adeptus Custodes unit from your army. You can use that unit's leadership when making morale tests for friendly Imperium. I guess you might use this if you're playing soup, but probably not. Actually, we're actually bad on morale. Our morale is not that great. And we don't get to re-roll it or anything. The Vexilla, don't forget the Vexilla. Most people forget about this. But the Vexilla has the ability that gives us a re-roll on the morales uh, for Imp Imperium as well. So I really don't see you needing to use this stratagem like ever. Okay, Shoulder the Mantle. So basically, if your Warlord dies, uh, for a CP, you can transfer the Warlord to a Shield Captain. So um, this is something that I used a lot when I played ETC. Not really that useful for ITC, um, but because um, you know killing the warlord usually doesn't count for anything unless people choose, choose old school. But for ETC, it can be a swing point there. So uh, important to keep that in mind uh, if you have a shield captain lying around and your warlord bites it, shoulder the mantle. Um, network machine spirits involves land raiders, therefore it sucks. Uh, Indomitable guardians is a great stratagem. So for one CP, this allows you to interrupt basically. And um, 
if you're within three inches of a, of an objective. So you have to keep that in mind. You have to be within three of an objective, but it gives you a second interrupt for only a CP. So you can do a two CP interrupt and you could do a one CP interrupt. Now, it's controversial right now and probably needs FAQ whether you can interrupt once with the two CP rulebook one, which says immediately after your opponent attacks, and then immediately use Indomitable Guardians, which just says after an enemy unit attacks in that phase. So after is not the same as immediately after, and the after is still after. So some people play it, and some TOs allow that you could do the two CP interrupt, then your Indomitable Guardians interrupt. Obviously, this has to be different units. Um, um, but some TOs say that you can do the you can do them both, but they have to, your opponent can attack once in between. I don't know. Uh, it's up in the air that needs to be FAQ'd. But basically, if you're within a range of an objective, you can interrupt for one less CP. So that can be pretty useful. Um, and uh, especially if it catches your opponent because they think you don't have enough CP to interrupt and you're standing on objective, they're trying to clear you off at the end of the game and you have one CP left and you can interrupt them. That's a good one. Okay, Inspire Fear. Uh, your opponent subtracts one from the morale tests. Yeah, don't bother with that. Sentinel Storm. Uh, choose one of your Adeptus Custodian units. Uh, Sentinel Blades can shoot um, in combat for 2 CP. Yeah. I mean, that's so fringe if you happen to have a unit that has enough S uh, Storm Shield Sentinel Blade Guardians to actually shoot in combat for 2 CP. Ugh, it's just pointless. Um, burst Missile Net. So basically, your Virtus Praetor, if they're shooting the Flak Burst Missiles, uh, reroll wound rolls so nobody really runs those missiles uh, so therefore you would never use this strategy um the uh, spark of divinity is the uh basically a uh unit infantry or biker unit within 12 inches can make a deny the witch test so that can be very useful for one cp uh unfortunately you start to roll it it's not like a straight up four up deny which would be nice um, but that can be very useful if there's a key power like a death hex that you need to stop or a, a key smite to stop or like a warp time that can be very useful to, to have that under your belt a spark of divinity so that's a great uh, uh, strategy plant the vexilla uh, so the vexilla if he does not move at the end of your movement phase it increases the vexilla range by six inches um, so that can be good, but generally you don't need that because your Vexilla can move and doesn't need that extra range. Um, in the odd circumstance, if you don't think you're going to, if you need to split yourself too wide and you want to give things minus one to hit, then sure, you could plant it, uh, for a CP, but then you can't move. So, and you can't charge either. So, you know, it's circumstantial, very circumstantial, but keep it in mind, you might find a use. Piercing Strike, um, so this is plus one to wound for Guardian Spears in the fight phase for a CP. So this is obviously a great stratagem if you're using guard a big unit of Guardians. Or even a small unit, you know, they're rocking like nine attacks, a three-man Guardian user rocking nine attacks. Plus one to wound can be a really big deal. So you're, uh, if you're, you're wounding T7 and up now on a four, and you're uh, 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 wounding fours, on a, uh, you're winning T6 on threes, and you're winning anything less than T6 on twos. So that can be pretty good, uh, wounding on twos, especially if you have Volaris around. So I think if you're running Guardian Spears, you have to always have uh, Piercing Strike in the back of your mind as something to use to get plus one to wound. Obviously, running a big, like, nine-man unit into, like, a knight with plus one to wound is pretty nice. Uh, so there's that. But it's only the Spears, remember. Inescapable Vengeance. So this allows your um, Alaris Terminators to shoot characters for 2 CP. If you have Alaris and you have a bunch of CP and there's a, a character you think you can kill, go for it. A guard characters especially because they'll be wounded on threes and taking two damage with on their invuln. So that's pretty good. Marine characters, not so much because um, you're wounding on fours. Um, but, you know, this can be useful if you have the CP and you have Alaris Custodians. It's part of their suite of tricky things that they can do. So, but it's two CP, so it's kind of expensive. So better be a character that's worth it. Um, Wisdom of the Ancients, basically your Dreadnought gives a six inch reroll, hit rolls of one aura. 
Um, so I used to use it when I ran the Telemon near the end of the game when my when my reroll uh, characters left and my Telemon was just at the back and I had lots of CP and so he could just give himself his own reroll ones. Um, so it can be useful. Generally, you've got the characters around, um, but you know it can be useful circumstantially or if you're Tyler and you've got three Telemons at the front, that can be pretty useful. Um, castle and Strike for CP gives your Castle and Axes minus three instead of minus two. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, the difference between giving a three up save, a five up save and a six up save is big. Um, same with if you're trying to kill a knight and you're wounding on fours already. Now you need to make the knight save on a six up instead of a five up. That's huge. So I think if you're running a big unit of axes, you need to be prepared to spend a CP on castle and strike. Uh, George Gorjewski, welcome. I know how to fix custodies. Give them all the marine strats. Yeah. <laughs> um, so cast and strike can be useful if you're running, you know, big unit of wardens or uh, Alaris. Concussion grenades. So another great stratagem that has become, that was marginal in the old days when there was not really much overwatch that we feared. And the feared overwatch that we did have, Tau, everything else could still overwatch or had fly, so it didn't affect them. Um, uh, yeah, or it wasn't infantry. Yes, yeah, infantry only. So there was a, a few reasons why concussion grenades was not that great, but now with marines, uh, you know, aggressors, um, intercessors, all these things that have a lot of crazy overwatch. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Ultramarines, who all the units, three other units within six can overwatch. You know, it can have its uses. It is still limited by the infantry keyword, which unfortunately makes it much less useful than it can be. But it, it's basically you're auto-hitting with your grenade launchers. And so you should, and D3 shots, so you should be able to s use this stratagem and affect a number of different infantry units if you have that many. But, um, and they can't overwatch and a minus one to hit. So that's pretty good. Like, it's a great stratagem for one CP if only it wasn't limited by the infantry keyword. Um, so, uh, yeah. But there's no restriction against fly or anything like that. So that's good. So I think, again, if you're running Alaris Terminators, this is another uh, little trick in there. There's like our Trixie's unit. Uh, trick they can use they can target characters in a shooting phase for two cp and they can concuss people for no overwatch so that can be quite useful in the right circumstance okay eyes of the emperor i can't even remember what this is oh yeah um when you generate tactical objective generate a new one so obviously this is no use in itc it might be useful if you're playing you know casual book games and it could be potentially quite useful in etc uh, where you have only 18 cards, so you kind of know what you might draw. And it could be the difference between winning and losing a 20-0 and uh, getting one or two points. So this can be quite nice. Not every book has this, abil this kind of ability, so um, this can be nice in ETC, and that's probably where you'd see it used. Uh, Victor the Blood Games, okay, or what I like to call Victor the Hunger Games. So this, again, was given quite a good rating by Goonhammer, and by and large, most of us don't use it. I used to use it a lot when I used to soup and we could CP regen. So you could usually just spend one or have this for free on a number of characters. But now I just don't think it's a good use of 2 CP. If you have a battalion and you have 9 CP, then maybe. But certainly if you're not playing with more than 4 or 5 CP, hell no. And the thing is, re-rolling one hit roll one rune roll or one save roll in each turn. So generally, you're hitting on twos, re-rolling your own ones because it's characters. So that's not really that helpful. Um, then uh, wound roll might be helpful, but then what are you either shooting 12 hurricane bolters, two bolter shots, or like attacking with like three to five attacks. Not that helpful. And if Valoris is around, re-roll one. So not that helpful. And then, uh, and you can use the CP for your reroll, right? And then one save is maybe where it would be the most helpful is rerolling a save roll. And um, so is that worth two CP expenditure at the front? 
Um, it depends on what character you put it on. If you put it on a shield captain and he's going to be going forwards, then you're probably not going to help you that much because you're, you're just going to take so much fire that that CP was wasted and he's going to die. Um, so generally, I don't think it's... It's a very tantalizing stratagem, and it seemed when the f book first came out that it was amazing, um, but it, it's it's not that great. And now, if you take salamanders or I think Eldar have it, these they just get army wide free reroll hit, free reroll wound, um, like every phase, every time they shoot or fight or whatever. And that doesn't cost him anything. It's just like, ah, oh, this cost me 2, two CP. Like, and now you know what? When I did use it, I always forgot it. So, yeah. Generally, I'm not sold on this stratagem. Uh, if people have good results with it, they can sure, certainly disagree with me. But it has not been a good use of 2 CP in the times that I have used it. Unless it was during that time when we could get all the CP back. So, yeah. Okay. Even in death, basically, is our 2 CP, the character can fight um uh before he's died uh sure i mean that can be pretty good uh if you have two cp when your character dies and if it's worth it so just like all the other fighting ones you know it can be good situationally avenge the fallen one of my favorite and most common uses of cp avenge the fallen so basically the uh, uh, unit um can increase its number of attacks by the number of models that it's lost in this turn so um, generally when you're fighting back if you've been interrupted um or uh if you eat stuff on overwatch you can get those attacks back so basically in a five-man unit with four attacks losing two guys is kind of the sweet spot uh if you have six or seven bikes and losing three guys is the sweet spot because there's a diminishing returns where losing a guy actually you lose more attacks than the attacks that you get back because you get one attack extra on each guy so so yeah so in a five-man aqualon unit for example two guys is kind of the ultimate because now each guy is doing six attacks so you have six 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 eighteen attacks whereas at uh one guy lost it's five times four so it's 20 attacks so yeah so actually so in a five-man unit um losing you can negate the loss of one guy with this stratagem and you can lose only two attacks lose only half attacks only two attacks if you lost two guys with this stratagem so and then once you lose three guys now you have th seven attacks per two guys so it's only 14 so like either way it gets you attacks back but it's most efficient at the loss of one or two guys on in a five man unit um so but it can be so nice uh to be able to avenge the fallen and it's certainly something that most people are not expecting uh so avenge the fallen great stratagem Bringers of Justice, so this is exploding sixes against Heretic and exploding fours against Black Legion. I'd love it if uh, there was more Black Legion out there and I'd explode on fours, but at the end of the day, there isn't. Um, and uh, exploding sixes is fine, but probably just not worth one CP in our army. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think about it. Uh, Robert Moncel, welcome. Even though I don't play Custodians, this is still very helpful. Thank you. Well, Robert, we're just giving you all our secrets. So now you won't fall for a Homer. You won't fall for a Tanglefoot. You won't fall for a Vestafall. But, uh, but yeah, thank you for watching. Okay, and our final stratagem is Stooping Dive. So Stooping Dive uh, for 3 CP. This was especially the jam when, uh, 18, you know, 15 to 18 bike lists were the vogue allows a bike unit to declare a charge at the end of your opponent's charge phase. And then if they make that charge, they get to attack first, obviously a very powerful stratagem, even for three CP. Um, now, um, Keep in mind that you don't have to charge what got what charges you nearby. Obviously, if you get charged, you can't do it. But if somebody charges you nearby, you don't have to charge that unit. You could have a bike unit that's on the other side of the table, but four inches away from a unit over there, to charge that unit. So it doesn't say anywhere that you have to charge the unit that's close to you. Okay, so keep that in mind. Number one, it also works on bike captains, obviously, because they're Adeptus Custodes biker um so the other thing is you have to make the charge so do you want what level the distance of charge are you happy spending three cp for 
Uh, George, I already talked about those. You're just late. <laughs> um, so um, what level of charge risk are you willing to spend 3 CP for? Definitely less than 9. Um, 6? Would would you spend 3 CP to possibly fail a 6-inch charge? 5? 4? So it's a little bit limited by how desperately you need that charge and how far it is, right? And then also you uh, now, I mean, it was fine at the beginning. And then when they changed it so we couldn't fly over things in the charge rays, this strategy became useless. And then now it's just over models and not over train. So it's regained some of its usefulness. But again, you need to be able to fit your bike bases over whatever's intervening to get in there, including other bikes. So it used to be when you ran 18 bikes, you would set up two staggered bike units within each other so then they could um they could um stooping dive through the other unit four so you stagger them out that was kind of a deployment strategy with the th with the you know 20 20 bike list but you still need to be able to get in there in order to make the three cp worth it now um uh the best stooping die I ever did was in a can hammer team like two years ago against Dave Koska. Right in the middle, he put these scouts behind the ruins on an objective, and my bikes were like four inches away. And this was in the old days uh, where you could fly over anything, even in the charge phase. And I stooped him, got into his uh, scouts, killed the scouts, used three inch pile and three inch consolidate during that, and then. Uh, basically then it was my turn because that was his turn and then hit his lines turn two and that was game over. So it can be super good because of the extra movement it gives you. And I think you got to think carefully when you stoop, if it's going to do what you want it to do, kill what you need it to kill and how you can use that extra up to 12 inch charge, three inch pile in, three inch consolidate, and then it your turn next. How you can really use that to slingshot you forward. And I think that's the true power of stooping dive uh, is the extra movement. Basically up to 12, up to 18 inches of free movement in your turn. So in the same way, it's as nice as the heroic intervention trait, which will give you a three, six, nine inches of extra movement. So you got to think of it in that way as well. How can you use that extra movement, assuming that you're going to kill what you, you, you're supposed to kill? Um, if it's that important to you and you have plenty of CP, it may be worth just stooping one model just to kill it so you can get up to 18 inches of extra movement to get you further forward. So you have to think of it in that way, but it's an expensive resource and there are limitations now due to the rules. So um, I haven't stooped anyone in a long time, but that's because I'm saving my CP for Homer. Also, stooping dive is something that is relatively easy to play around now that it's pretty. When people see Custodes Bikers, the first thing they think about is stooping dive because um, everybody was eating it at the beginning and now everybody knows about it. Uh, there's way more ways to play around the stooping dive than there is to play around the homer. You can just make it not worth it to spend three CP by being six, seven, eight inches away. You got to make that mental math, right? So, uh, so it's much less likely these days to get off a stooping dive uh, than it used to be, uh, and way more limited. So, so there we go. That's all the stratagems. So people ask me before, what are the most common stratagems I use? Well, I covered that, so I always save 3 CP for the homer. I hope to get at least two to three of those back. I uh, tend to use Avenge the Fallen, and I use the Interrupt if appropriate, and uh, uh, Tanglefoot. And uh, I think it's always nice just to have a CP in the back pocket for a late game Tanglefoot um, or to stop an important fallback. So, so those are the kind of things I use my very limited 4 CP for. Of course, if I spend a 3 CP on a homer and I get 3 CP back like I did today, now in effect I had 7 CP. Uh, so, you know, it feels pretty good. Um, you can even spend one on the odd reroll, re but I rarely do that. So, uh, yeah. So... Um, that is it for Tactica Part 8. We talked about the Warlord traits, relics, and stratagems. Uh, do post any questions that you have in the chat below. I'll answer them before we go. The um, um, next, uh, as I said uh, this afternoon, next week I'm away in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and uh, I will try, if the internet is good enough at the hotel, to do a... Uh, just a quick, uh, maybe a can hammer TV talk about some uh, chapter approved, but otherwise there will be no, uh, uh, game live stream next week. And then, um, 
The week after, we start on our ETC games. We have some people lined up for the first few weeks of December uh, to play ETC leading up to Canhammer Team Tournament. So that should be exciting. Um, again, a call out to everybody watching. If you have Gene Stealer Cult Neophyte Webbers, web guns, please let me know. I need three. Um, and um, yeah. That's about it. Uh, so full mithril, uh, do join our chat, man. I think you'd find it really helpful. I don't think you necessarily need to go out there and buy a whole crap ton of Forge World. Um, we just need to, you know, uh, change how you think about how custodies play, really. And I think you'll actually have a lot more fun with them. Because uh, I tell you what, the bike list is just kind of not that fun. That, that's the main reason I stopped playing it was just not that fun. Um, it can be fun, but it can just be so not fun. So, so do consider joining the uh, the Discord. Everybody consider joining the Discord if you haven't joined already. Lots of people there chatting about custodies all the time, list advice and play advice. Um, you get to determine what armies I play against, and uh, that's that's about it. Oh. Okay, uh, so there's no more questions. I'm going to call it a night. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you. Shout out to the Custodies chat group. Um, and uh, please consider subscribing and following our channel. And uh, we do have a Patreon as well. And uh, if you still have a team and you want to come out to Can Hammer Team Tournament, please get yourself on the wait list. And uh, that's about it. So I will see you later. Have a good night.